you can turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We want to begin reading in verse 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And today, we're going to talk about the family. Is that all right with you guys? Amen. We're going to talk about the family and how we should treat each other and how the family can be a happy place. But notice here what the Bible says in Revelation 12, beginning at verse 7. Lord, again, we prayed before, but I pray once again to bless your word, to teach us that we will have clear understanding in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Revelation 12 and verse 7. Notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death, verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now today we're going to talk about the family, but brothers and sisters, I wanted to show us in this scripture where the very first family feud started. This is where the first family feud started, and God gives us an example here that no matter how perfect you raise your child, no matter how good a parent you are, there is still a chance for rebellion. God was the perfect parent. And he raised Lucifer to be his own. And the Bible says that Lucifer, though, however, he decided that he wanted to do his own thing. Listen to me now. He wanted to do his own thing. And he decided that he was too grown to abide by the rules and principles that God had. And because of that, there was war in heaven. When the child in the house, or if there's someone in the house who tries to disrupt the flow of the family, guess what? There is always war. And they don't want to abide by the laws and the principles, just as the devil did with God. There was war there in heaven. There's always war in the home when the child wants to be the parent, and the parent acts like the child. Someone say amen. But here... As a result, God threw the devil out. You see, in homes, there are people, just as what the devil did, who tried to accuse his brethren. Started back-talking and back-biting and accused the brethren. And God, we don't know how long God had mercy on him and God allowed these things to happen. But there comes to a point in time where God said, enough is enough. He was fed up and he eventually had to kick the devil out. And the Bible says that the family in the home, they can rejoice now. Why? Because the problem child is kicked out now. Are you guys following me? He kicked the problem child out. But then notice he cautions the people on the outside. He says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Be careful because this person is nothing but trouble. You see, God wants our homes to be happy. He wants us to make sure that we have happy homes. Ever since the beginning, before sin began, God instituted two things. We all know these two things. He instituted, number one was the Sabbath. You guys remember that? 
He instituted the Sabbath to be a blessing for mankind. But number two, he also instituted the family. And we see in our day that the devil is doing in all his power to destroy both the Sabbath and the family. Because the devil knows that where there's a broken family, there's a broken church. And where there's a broken church, there's a broken world. And can we see the results of that brokenness today? We see this world is so broken and we can see it even in our churches and it all stems from the family. Why? Because the family, the church is nothing but little families made up and brought up together. And when there's problems in the home, you can believe that there's problems in the church. And again, when there's problems in the church, we see that it affects the whole world. Ministry of Healing, page 349, tells us this, that the restoration and uplifting of humanity begins in the home. The work of parents underlies every other. Society is composed of families and is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. And the heart of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influence. It starts at the home, brothers and sisters. And today, that's what we're going to deal with. We're going to see what the Bible has to say about family. We're going to deal with a few issues. Number one, we're going to look at how children should be towards their parents. Is that okay? And then we're going to look at how parents should be towards their children. And then we're going to get down to the nitty gritty and how husbands and wives should deal with each other. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at how children should be towards their parents. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We know that there are problems in our homes, but... I praise the Lord that he's given us the Bible so that we can have a solution. What do you say? 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. Say amen if you're there, please. The Bible says this. This know also that in the last days perilous or dangerous times shall come. How many of you believe we're living in the last days? Amen. Notice what it says, though. It gives us signs of what will take place in the last days. Verse 2, the Bible says, For men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. Selfishness is the very first thing that Paul told Timothy would be the problem in the last days. And do you guys agree with Paul? Yes. Selfishness. For the most part, selfishness is the number one reason why we have broken homes. Selfishness is the number one reason why we have problems with our relationships. Why? Because we're not thinking about the other person, but we're thinking about who? Ourselves. And Paul says that the number one thing is men shall be lovers of their own selves. It goes on to say covetous, that's wanting other people's things. Boasters, that's talking about, about themselves and bragging. It says they're proud, blasphemers. And notice the next one. What does it say? Disobedient to parents. Come on now. Yes, children, this is one of the signs of the last days that children will be disobedient to their parents. Now, do we see that today? You better believe it. Lord, help us. Children, you need to be happy that we are living in 2017 and not in Old Testament times. You know why you need to be happy? Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Look at what Deuteronomy 21 says, okay? Old Testament, Deuteronomy. After the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21, beginning at verse 18. Young people, children, youth, should be happy that we are not living in the Old Testament times. Be happy and praise God that you're living in 2017. Why? Because notice... What this verse says here in Deuteronomy 21 and verse 18. The Bible says here, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, we can put daughter there also, 
which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place and they shall say unto the elders of his city this our son is stubborn and rebellious he will not obey our voice he's a glutton and a drunkard verse 21 notice and all the men of his city shall do what? Stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Have mercy somebody. Come on now. Children, you happy we're living in 2017, Melvin? You better say amen, Melvin. Come on now. Because here the parents had the right. If their children was continually stubborn and rebellious, the Bible says that this didn't happen right away, though, however. I'm not saying that it, once the child disobeyed right away, he was sent out to be stoned by the elders. No, the Bible says that the parents took time to chasten him. They tried to discipline him, but it tells us that he continued to rebel. He continued to disobey, and they brought them to the elders, and they had the right back in those days to take him out and stone him as an example. But you know what, young people? We're living in 2017, and it's a little bit different today. Because now there are laws against those type of things. Come on now. But the Bible tells us that children, you need to listen and obey your parents. Notice what Proverbs 1. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. Psalms, then Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. Children need to listen and obey their parents. Proverbs 1 and verse 8. The Bible says here, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. The Bible says that my son or my daughter, hear the instructions, listen to the instructions of your father. It goes on to say to forsake not the law of thy mother. Why? Because this, in fact, is one of God's commandments. We studied it during Wednesday night prayer meeting, Sister Janet, didn't we? How the Bible says that one of the commandments are to honor your father and your mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, because children need to obey. It's one of God's commandments. The Bible even says that you need to obey and listen to your parents even when they're old. So here, it's not only talking about young children, but even as adults, you need to listen to your parents. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 6 that children, notice what it says here, Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents. What's those next three words, however? In the Lord. Come on now, what is it again? In the Lord. You have parents sometimes who may not be following the Lord. And I know there are some parents who teach their children to do bad things. There are some parents who are not in the Lord who teach their children to sell drugs. You have no parents like that? I do. There are children who, who, there are parents who say, as long as their children do drugs and drink alcohol in my house, it's okay. Well, guess what? The Bible says to obey your parents, but as long as they are in the Lord. So if your parents tell you to do something contrary to what God asked you to do, just as Peter said, I'd rather obey God rather than man. We need to obey God rather than man as long as your parents are abiding in the principles that God laid out. Children, you have the duty to obey your parents. If they're teaching you the wrong things, then you have the right to not obey them, but to obey God rather than them. It goes on to say, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Verse 2 says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Here, the Bible says that there's a promise that you will live long and prosper upon the earth if you honor your father and your mother. Now, why? Why is that a promise? Well, guess what? Your parents... They've been around the block a couple times. Parents, have you been around the block a couple times? Come on now. And you've seen right and wrong. And you've even experienced yourself mistakes that you wish you've never done. And the reason why sometimes you nag your children, and do we do that sometimes to our, to our children? Come on, parents. Yes, we do sometimes. But the reason why we do that is because we do not want them to make the same mistakes that we have done. Right, right. My father always told me, don't be like me, be better than me. Because he's made mistakes in the past that he has to suffer with in his age. And we as parents, we want to do the same thing. We want to make sure that our children don't follow in our footsteps, but that they do even better than us. And that's why it's a promise that God has made that if we honor, that if we obey them, we can live well upon this land. Now, parents, I know sometimes it's hard to teach our children. So children, we need to obey and honor our parents. That's our duty to our parents. But parents... The Bible speaks to us on how we need to deal with our children. And notice the next verse in verse 4. The Bible says this. And ye fathers. Now here it's specifically speaking to fathers. But I believe it can apply to our mothers as well. But it says fathers. It says provoke not your children to wrath. Lord help me. I know as a father, sometimes I do want to give that extra push. Fathers, can I get a witness? Any fathers in here that try to push their kids sometimes and kind of push them a little bit too much? Well, am I the only one? Okay. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Right. And it's hard sometimes, right? Because we want the best for them. But sometimes kids are hard-headed. But we, rem we forget how hard-headed we were as well, don't we? But it says, don't provoke your children unto wrath. In another version of the Bible, it says, don't annoy your children to cause them to be angry. Don't annoy them. Don't push them. And I know the reason why it says fathers, because you see that in the sports world today. You see how fathers want to push their kids in the sports, and they may not even like sports, but because they play football, or because they play basketball, or they play baseball, they want their children to do that. But guess what? Sometimes children, that's not their thing. The Bible says don't provoke, don't annoy your child to wrath, but it tells us what they need to do. But bring them up, the verse goes on to say, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Did you guys hear that? You need to bring them up in the nurture. And the word nurture in other verses says to educate and to train our children in the admonition, admonition of the Lord. You've heard the text Proverbs 22 verse 6 before, train up the child, a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will what? He will not depart from it. Now, when I looked at this text, I said, yes, this is a great text. You need to train up your child. But when I look specifically at, specifically at the part where it says in the way he should go, I used to think in the way that I think he should go. Have you ever thought that before? Mm -hmm. Train up the child in the way you think he should go. But it says in the way he should go. It doesn't say in the way you think he should go. Listen to this now. You need to train up your child in the way that he should go. In other words, in the way that God wants him to go. Children are different. People are different. And you can't train one child 
this way and expect that if you train a different child the same way you train that child, that they're going to go in the same direction. You have to allow that child to develop their own skills and their own character and their own gifts. And when you see those gifts, when you see those, 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 those traits, then you train that child in the way that God is leading them. Why? Because, you know, I had friends who were not good in school. You ever, is anyone here not good in school? Right? God. Got a, a, a C average, and I'm not talking about C's is great. I'm talking about you had a C on your paper and said, see me after class. Have you ever had that? Cassie had that one time. It's funny. Cassie, you remember that? Yeah. Some people, some children, school is not their thing. And I'm not saying, however, education is not good. Come on now. We all need to learn. But I had a friend one, one time that school he used to just get bad grades after bad grades after bad grades. But if you put an engine in front of him, if you put something mechanical in front of him, his mind was working where he knew exactly how that engine worked. His gift wasn't in the school books, but it was in practical things. I knew people who, who, who didn't know how to tie their shoelace when they're in junior high, but they can sing like a bird. Come on now. You see, there are, people have different gifts, and we need to train our child in the way they should go. Not necessarily in the way we think they should go. But as we train them in the way God has laid out in the way they should go, when they're old, guess what? They're not going to depart from it. Now, even though this is a principle, it's not a guarantee because we've seen it just with Jesus and with God and, and being a faithful parent. There's always a chance for rebellion. We talked about that already. But now notice what it says in 2 Timothy. Turn with me to 2 Timothy, back to 2 Timothy. Because when we train our children, there are, however, certain things that we should train them about. Notice what it says here, back to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14, notice what it says here, this is Paul, Paul speaking to young Timothy, he says, but continue in thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom that thou hast learned them. So he's telling young Timothy, continue in the things that you learn. Continue in the things that you are assured of. And remember who taught you these things. Notice verse 15. And that from a what everyone? From a child thou hast known the what? Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Here, Timothy is told by Paul that he needs to continue into things that he learned as a grown-up, as a what? As a child. We need to train our children and we need to start young. Somebody say amen. And here the Bible says, you see, sometimes we think that the Bible is just for grown-ups. But here the Bible says that as a child, Timothy was known of the scriptures. It's amazing how children could retain things in their mind. And that's why at our house we like to use scripture songs. You guys like scripture songs? Yeah. Your... Because you know when you put scripture to song, when you put anything to a song, it's easier to remember. Right? And here the Bible tells us that as a young child, Timothy learned the scriptures. And then when it was able to make him wise unto salvation, and it taught him about faith in Jesus Christ. So parents, we need to teach our children Scripture. In fact, notice this paragraph coming from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 144. It tells us this, in too many households, prayer is neglected. If ever there was a time when every house should be a house of prayer, it is now. Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and for their children. 
Let the Father as priest of the household lay upon the altar of God the morning and evening, evening sacrifice while the wife and children unite in prayer and praise. In such a household, Jesus will love to tarry. I want Jesus to love to tarry in my house. What about you? Evangelism 499 says this, Evening and morning join with your children in God's worship, reading His word, singing His praise. Teach them to repeat God's law. She puts an emphasis on evening and morning worship at home. But then she goes on to tell us how we should conduct our service. Notice what it says here. Let the seasons of family worship be short and spirited. Did you hear that? Do not let your children or any member of your family dread them because of their tediousness or lack of interest. When a long chapter is read and explained and a long prayer offered, his precious, this precious service becomes wearisome and it is a relief when it is over. Let the Father select a portion of the scripture that is interesting and easily understood. Few verses will be sufficient to furnish a lesson which may be studied and practiced through the day. Questions may be asked, a few earnest, interesting remarks made, or an incident short to the point may be brought in by way of illustration. At least a few verses of spirited songs may be sung, and the prayer offered should be short and pointed. The one who leads in prayer should not pray about everything, but should express his needs in simple words and praise God with thanksgiving. Worship in the home should be short and to the point. I want to haste to say that even prayer in the worship service should be short and to the point. I read that one, one place in Sister White's writings. I went, went to a church, Lord have mercy, where one of my elders, he, he preached those long prayers. Have you ever been in a church like that before? Where I think he preached the whole book of Genesis. <laughs> And by the end of his prayer, half of the members woke up from their sleep. Keep your long prayers in your closet. Someone say amen. That's where your long prayer should be in the closet when it's just you and God alone. But when you have family worship, when you have worship at church, keep it short and to the point. You don't want the children. Even I have a short attention span. Come on now. And I don't want the worship service to be boring, but I want it to be short and to the point. With that said, let me move on. Come on, amen. The Bible goes on to say, let's go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, 24. Parents, we need to train up our children. Train them in the way they should go. Don't provoke them, but teach them. Educate them. Nurture them. Proverbs 13, 24. We need to show them scripture. Teach them Bible. Notice, however, what it says in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24. Notice, there comes a time, however, when we need to do something that the Bible advises. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. The Bible says, He that spareth his what, everyone? His rod hates his son, but he that loves him chasteneth him betimes or quickly. The Bible says that, parents, you need to use your rod. Yeah. That's talking about the rod correction. of correction, the rod of discipline. Now I want us to be very careful, however. Because you got to be careful how you use that rod. Come on now, someone say amen. Because if you get caught using that rod in the wrong way, you'll get the cops at your door. I remember, however, back in the days, guess what? That rod wasn't spared with me. Have mercy. Come on now. Growing up, now my dad rarely used the rod. That was the job of my mother. And she used anything that she could find. Back scratcher, slipper, the belt, 
Whatever she can find. And back then as a child, I hated it, but now I can see why she did it. However, nowadays, you need to be very careful. And I'm not talking about abuse, because there's a line that you can cross where it goes from discipline to abuse. But I've learned as a parent growing, as a parent, that there are different ways to use the rod of correction. And if you can not use the actual rod, praise the Lord. But you have to be wise because you can use other forms of discipline. Because oh, yeah. sometimes physical abuse is not as bad as mental and emotional abuse. Because you can abuse your children emotionally as well. But we're not talking about abuse. The Bible is not talking about abuse. The Bible is talking about discipline. And there's a big difference in that. In fact, the Bible says that we need to use that rod. And when you look at the word a rod in terms of biblical times, it was what a shepherd used to lead his sheep. And he didn't beat his sheep with his rod, he gently guided them and corrected them with the rod. In fact, he used that rod to beat away the wolves for, to protect the sheep from those wolves. But you got to be careful when you use that rod of correction. In fact, notice what it says in Proverbs 23. Let's turn to Proverbs 23 here. Okay, because some people will use this text. kind of out of line here. Proverbs 23 verse 13. The Bible says here withhold not correction from the child. See here's where they get it twisted. For if thou beatest him with the rod he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Right. It does use the word beat but again it's not talking about abuse. It's not talking about child abuse. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Don't let your child just roam around and do whatever they want to do. Don't let the television raise your child. You need to raise your child yourself. The Bible says here that there are times that as parents, we need to discipline our children. Now, we're, we're going to get into the husbands and the wives. But before we do that, I want to go to Proverbs, excuse me, Psalm 68. Let's go to Psalm 68 because I want to give some hope to single parents out there. The Bible gives us hope here for single parents, whether you're single home through being a widow or widower or through separation, the Bible gives hope. It says in Psalm 68 and verse 5, notice what it says here. Psalm 68 and verse 5, the Bible says, A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. The Bible says that God will be the father to that fatherless. Jeremiah 49, 11, just write it down or read it in your hearing. Jeremiah 49, 11 says, Leave thy fatherless children. I will preserve them alive and let thy widows trust in me. God will fill the void of that husband or that wife who is not there. And he will make sure and take care of your children. Isaiah 54 and verse 5 says, For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Again, God will take the place of that spouse who is not there, of that parent who is not there. And if we put our trust in him, he will preserve your children alive. I can remember hearing a pastor one day who he met his father when he was older, but as he was growing up, he didn't have his father in his life. And when he met his father for the first time, his father was apologizing to him and saying he was sorry for this and sorry for that. And the pastor said, you don't need to apologize. And he says, how can you not be mad at me? The father said, how can you not have a grudge over me? Well, he said, you know, as a young child and as a young man, I was. 
But as I grew up, I realized that God may have a plan, have had a plan for you not to be in my life. Because if you were in my life, I would grow up and be like you. He said, if I grew up, I'd possibly be like you. So I thank God that he has not allowed you in my life. So mothers or fathers who are single parents, there's hope in Jesus. But now let's look at husbands and wives and our relationships. Now in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, God outlined the principles on how the family should be. Remember, he made Adam first and he did not make Eve right away. And I believe there was a reason for that. He made Adam first and he was by himself. Why? Because I believe he wanted Adam to know who God was for himself first. He wanted Adam to develop his relationship with God by himself first and he wanted Adam to be familiar with his surroundings and he wanted Adam to know what his purpose in his life was first before he made Adam a help meet. And when God saw that the time was right for Adam to have a wife, at first he put Adam to sleep and the Bible says that he took out of Adam one rib. How many ribs? One. Come on. <laughs> one rib, not all the ribs, right? But one rib from his side. And you've heard before that God didn't take Eve out of man's head because he didn't want the wife to be head over the husband. He didn't take Eve out of, the, out of Adam's foot because he didn't want the husband to walk all over the wife. But he took Adam and he took Eve out of Adam's side, showing that they were to be equal, showing under his arm, showing how Adam would nurture and protect his wife. And as Adam was asleep, he took Eve and guess what? I don't believe he woke up Adam right away. But as he was sleeping, he spent time with Eve alone as well. And he made sure that Eve had a relationship with him and that she knew what her purpose in life was. And then when the time was set, he woke Adam up and he put both of them together and had them spend time with each other on that Sabbath so that they could understand their roles and so that they could have their relationship with God with not only each other, but get to know God together. The Bible says, however, that sin came into the picture. And some pastor once said the reason why sin came into the picture, and I didn't say it, a pastor said it was because Eve wanted to become a career woman. Come on. <laughs> I didn't say it. But she wanted to do her own thing and she went off the side of Adam and you know the story. And after sin came into existence, you see the roles were already put in place. But after sin came into existence, God had to define those roles and show the boundaries. And in fact, notice Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Notice what it says here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Because here Adam and Eve sin. They sin and then God had to reveal the roles for them. Notice what it says in Genesis 3 and verse 16. The Bible says here, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Let's pause right there. Ladies who had babies. Is this true today? Yes. When you have children, do you feel pain? Yes. Do you feel sorrow? Yes. Do you feel these things? It's true, isn't it, ladies? Yes. Well, guess what? Just as that part of the verse is true, the second part of that verse is true as well. Notice what the second part of that verse says. 
and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall what, everyone? Rule over thee. Uh-oh, come on now. There are a lot of ladies who don't want to hear this part of the Bible. What? My husband shall rule over me, but that's what the Bible says. That's why, ladies, you need to be careful who you choose as your husband. Ladies should have said amen. Come on now. Ain't that right, Brother Don? Because that husband is to rule over you. Now, some people say, well, that's Old Testament, Pastor Mara. That's Old Testament. Well, let's go to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5. Notice, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I know, I know, I know. Don't worry, ladies. We're going to talk to the men as well, but we're going to deal with the ladies first. Ephesians chapter 5. Notice what it says in verse 22. The Old Testament says that he shall rule over you. So you need to be careful who you choose as your husband. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, notice what it says here. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Did you guys hear that? Yes. Wives, submit yourselves. And notice, did you hear that? Unto your own husband. Not unto everybody else's husband, but your own husband. That's what the Bible says. And this may not even be talking about adultery, but sometimes wives can be caught up in doing this and doing that. They think that they forget about their husband and submitting themselves to him. So you need to be careful that if you do want to work and if your husband allows you to be a working wife, that you still need to remember that you need to take care of your husband and submit to him. Someone say amen. Come on, is my wife listening out there? Amen. Notice verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. The husband, again, this is New Testament now, the Bible says is the head of the wife. The ladies, I know, it's a hard thing to swallow sometimes, but if you have a husband who loves the Lord, it's the most rewarding thing that you can ever experience. Because if your husband loves the Lord, you know that even though he rules over you, even though he's head over you, he's not going to take advantage of you. He's not going to abuse you, but he's going to treat you as Christ treats the church. In fact, the Bible goes on to say, speaking to husbands now, verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, we even have a greater responsibility. Why? Because we need to be able to sacrifice even our own lives for our wives. Husbands, say amen. Come on now. And even if your wife is a shopaholic, guess what? You got to love your wife anyway. And you... <laughs> If that's the wife you chose, you may have to work two or three jobs just to satisfy your wife. Come on now. That's why you got to be careful who you choose as a wife too. But it says, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a sacrifice, husbands, that you have to be for your wives. You have to sacrifice and love your wife and treat them as unto the weaker vessel with grace and with love. You need to honor them, Peter says. Pray for them. Be one-minded with them. Be courteous. Be, uh, be, be lo loving towards them. And not render evil for evil. Not render railing for railing, but blessing for blessing. You know... Even though we know these principles, and even when, if we practice these principles in the homes, there still are some problems in the homes. Every marriage is not perfect. Someone say amen. Come on now. There may be disagreements. There may be fights. But the Bible says that even though there's disagreements and fights, 
that you may have to learn to agree to disagree, but still love one another. It says you may be angry, but Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. At the end of the day, even if you have disagreements, you still need to get it right and know that you guys love each other. And remember the vows that you gave, till death do you part. And you need to work out those problems. Now, ladies, it doesn't speak to guys, but it talks about the ladies in this particular verse. Turn with me to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21, okay? Proverbs chapter 21. Now, in November, we're going to specifically have a seminar dealing with different aspects of the family, dealing with different aspects of husbands and wives and parents and children. Today was kind of a, a broad overall view of what the Bible has to say, but we're going to go into more depth and we're going to invite the community out to that family seminar. But today we're going to deal with just each other here. And notice what it says in Proverbs 21. Now, ladies, this is specifically dealing with you, but I know that there are a lot of men who are like this as well. But notice what it says here in Proverbs 21 and verse 9. The Bible says here, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. You guys hear that? You guys heard that, voice, that, that verse before? It says, Men, it's better you can have a big house. It says a white house. Isn't that what it says? But it's better for you to go on that rooftop, find a place in that corner, than to be inside that house with a brawling and contentious woman. Lord have mercy. Now, brethren, we have no right to hit a woman. Someone say amen. But you do have a right to get on top of that rooftop. Someone say amen. Come on now. Now, because that mouth may go on and on, you know, nagging is a no-no, man, and it's dealing specifically with women. How do I know? Because notice what it says in verse 19. It, it says in verse 19, now it says it twice in the same chapter. That's telling you guys something. Verse 19 says, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Lions. Wild beasts, snakes. The Bible says it's better to be outside in the wilderness with them than with a contentious and angry woman. Lord, help us. But that's why he made those rooftops, amen? That's why he made those, that wilderness. But men and women, husbands and wives, the thing we need to understand is that we in a relationship, it's not a 50-50 thing. But it's a 100 and a 100 thing. You need to give it all. And guess what? It's not a two-way relationship. It's a three-way relationship. Are you guys following me? It's a relationship with you and your spouse, but God should be in that relationship as well. I look at it as a triangle with God at the head. You see, the closer and closer the husband and wife get closer to God, the closer and closer the husband and wife get closer to each other. So brothers and sisters, we need to put God first in our families. As we conclude, I want to give you guys with some tips. Number one, for husbands and wives, continue in your courtship. Continue to go on dates. Continue to flirt with each other. Someone say amen. I don't care how old you are. Continue to flirt with each other. Continue to tell your wife how sexy she is. Come on now. Continue to tell her husband how buff he is, even if he's not. Come on. Just give him that motivation. Amen. Number two, don't forget that God is the one who joined you together. Number three, you need to guard your thoughts. Because the devil will try to plant those thoughts in your head. 
Try to make you go against your family and your spouse. Number four, we talked about don't go to bed angry. Number five, you need to pray together. Number six, you need to understand that divorce is not the answer. Number seven, keep the family circle tight. Don't let anyone try to come in and break it up. Number eight, show love for one another. Hug each other. Kiss each other. Tell each other that you love each other. Number nine, respect each other's privacy. That's a big one. Don't be insecure, but respect each other's privacy. Number ten, speak kindly to one another. And last but not least, keep Christ as the center of the home. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Today, brothers and sisters, my appeal to us, if we want to have happy homes, happy families, happy relationships, is that we need to abide by God's word. Number one, we need to put God first and center of our homes. Is that your desire, friends, to have a happy home? Amen. Is it your desire to have a happy home where Jesus and angels love yeah. to dwell? Yeah. Well, guess what? If we apply these things to our lives and have happy homes, then we can have a happy church. So, brothers and sisters, I want to have a happy church. What about you? Yeah. But it starts at the home. When we have a happy home, we can have a happy church. When we have a happy church, we can be an example to the world to show them that Christ indeed wants to bless us. Would you pray with me? Bow your heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we want to do what you asked us to do. For children, Lord, give us strength to obey our parents in the Lord. For parents... Give us strength and wisdom on how to train and raise our children, even in discipline. For single parents, we pray, Lord, that you give us strength and trust and hope in you to help raise our children. And for husband and wives, Lord, we pray that you give us strength to love one another and to treat each other with love and respect. So, Lord, I pray for our homes that we represent in here. I pray that we'll put Christ in the center so that we can have a happy home. And so, Lord, at the end of the day, our church can be happy and united as well. So that we can be witnesses to the world that Christ is indeed in charge and he wants us to be united. So, Lord, bless each and every one of us here and the families that we represent. Help us, Lord, to be one with you so that we can be one with each other. Father, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. And those who agreed, we all said amen, amen. and amen.